just ask yourself a simple question. Why not me? You know, why can't I be the person that changes the world? Why can't I be the one that goes for it? Why not you? You know, and just ask yourself next, what do I have to do to get there? And why don't I do it? You know, those just those simple things, write them on your wall, write them on the back of your hand, write them on a piece of paper so you have them that remind you. Put them on your screen as your default screen, you know, just to remind you that it can be you. There's going to be world-changing companies that are created, world-changing charities. We can live our lives completely differently. Maybe that comes from you. Maybe it comes from somebody at Elevate because you just had that mindset. Well. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Elevate's Career Discussions. Today, I'm super excited to have one of my favorite guests yet, a billionaire entrepreneur, a famed investor on ABC's Shark Tank, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks NBA franchise. It's none other than Mark Cuban. You know, Mark is just an incredible person on all fronts, a business leader, an entrepreneur, an investor, and most importantly, a mentor. Despite his success, I've always been taken aback by how genuine and how helpful he is. So I am super excited for everyone here and at Elevate to learn from his experiences and hear his advice. I really love doing this interview for so many reasons, but some of my favorite parts were, one, hearing about his advice on career success. You know, what is the mentality that is needed to be successful and also how to find things in your career that you're both truly passionate about, but also can become the best at such that you can have the most impact. And then finally, about how to taste risks over the course of your career. Then I really enjoyed our discussion around building his skill sets as an investor and what he does to keep those up on a daily basis as well as his experience as an investor on Shark Tank. You know, what types of things he looks for in businesses, in entrepreneurs, in ideas, as well as in companies, given his own track record as an incredible investor. It was also really interesting to hear about his journey as a CEO and some of the challenges that he has faced in that role. And then finally, I hit him with some quick hit questions, like what he did when he first found out he was a billionaire. If he'd run for president, you have to listen for that answer. Um, his failures, as well as some of his mentors and a lot of other questions. For anyone that's new to Elevate, Elevate is a premier career resource platform for students and professionals interested in business, finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and technology careers, powered by successful professionals from some of the top firms in the world. As always, you can follow all these conversations on our YouTube channel, subscribe here, our Instagram, at Elevate Career and on our website at elevatelab.org. So without any further ado, let's get to the interview. I wanted to organize this discussion into a few different uh, topical areas. So we'll start with kind of the career success journey and, and just general career advice, maybe, Mark. Um, you know, we work with thousands of students and professionals. who are really, really hungry, right? Um, what is some advice that you can give, like right off the, off the bat, to these students and young professionals as they're entering or early in their career journeys? First, um, you don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up. Um, second is there's no perfect job. You don't need to find the perfect job. You know, like you mentioned, you just spent all this time spent, you know, paying $200,000 or whatever it is to get that education. You paid a lot to learn. Now this is your chance to get paid to learn. And, you know, things have kind of changed over the, the last few decades where, you know, back in the day, people would graduate from college and look specifically for a career. You know, they went to Goldman Sachs and it wasn't a bad thing if you planned on staying at Goldman Sachs till you got a gold watch. You know, now people tend to be free agents and I think that's a much better opportunity. You know, we live in a world where technology changes and, you know, the society changes on an ongoing basis. And so, you know, as you, as you go out into your life, um, you don't, don't need to make perfect choices because when you go into that first job, it really is a stepping stone where you're getting paid to learn about yourself, about, you know, the business world and about the things you do and don't like. Yeah, that's super helpful. One thing a lot of our students really struggle with, Mark, is the idea of risk in their careers, right? So, you know, they've been on this linear upward path throughout their whole lives, you know, go to, from high school to college, et cetera. Um, how do you think about 
or you know, how, how should they think about taking risks and, and frankly, like not being afraid of, afraid of failure? Um, this is opportunity. I mean, look, when you're 22 or even after an MBA program, 24, 25, what have you got to lose? I know it, like, you know, you alluded to it, you're on an upward path and you want that momentum to continue and you think you've got to overachieve in everything you do. But the reality is, you know, the safer route you take, the less opportunity that's available to you. I mean, that's part of the risk reward you learn in college, right? Particularly in MBA schools. And so, you know, it really, I always looked at it after um, I got out of school. It's like, what have I got to lose? Now is the time for me to take chances because I, I was confident enough that if it didn't work, you know, I'd land on my feet and find a way to get where I needed to go. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I'll go back to the free agent mindset. You know, it's not really a career. You're, you're just like an MBA or NFL free agent where, you know, you get to see where you are um, in terms of the competition and in terms of other free agents and kind of set your own path. But you, you don't, you can only do that if you take that first step. And I don't really think it's risky, you know, because being young, you've got a lot of years to go. You've got a lot of years to catch up if that first step isn't what you expected. That's fair. Um, and then the question of fear comes up a lot. I think, you know, you've talked about it. Were you maybe born with less fear because you've been a successful entrepreneur? Like, you know, how did you overcome fear or anxiety about taking these risks over your career? I mean, I was always terrified <laughs> of a lack of fear. Um, but I never had, you know, I, I didn't come from a lot, so I never had anything to lose. You know, um, I never, you know, I snuck into the MBA program at Indiana, you know, my freshman year, I, back in the day when, um, you, we could register with um, computer cards instead of digitally. Um, you know, I, I started taking it. I took my first class, in, an MBA level class in statistics, and I literally snuck in. And they just assumed that I was in the MBA program. So by the time I was, a, you know, halfway through my sophomore year in college, I had a year of my MBA done until they found out and kicked me out. And so I was always a risk taker, um, but I was always in a situation where I really didn't have anything to lose. You know, my, my worst fallback was I was back where I started and I'd have to go forward. And so, you know, it wasn't, wasn't for lack of fear. Fear's always motivated me in a big way. I was terrified, but it, it really pushed me to be more prepared. And so when I went into new situations, I really tried to just ask myself, how can I, how can I give myself an advantage? What can I do to give myself an edge over all my peers? You know, because you, you're going to start in a class of however many people typically right? And, and there'll be 5, 10, 15, 20. And what is it that you can do to, to really distinguish yourself? And those are the things I tried to do. Um, I can tell you stories. Like my first, one of my first jobs was, well, actually my first job after Indiana was at Mellon Bank in Pittsburgh. And um, I went in there and like, I, I was, I don't know if it was stupid or fearless, but I literally sent a note to the CEO. I went in and let me take a step back. I went into thinking my, my number one job at Mellon Bank was to make Mellon Bank more profitable because I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Makes sense, right? So I literally sent a note to the CEO with a suggestion on how I thought we could make Mellon Bank more profitable. You know, and I, I hadn't even been there a month and my <laughs> boss was freaking out. The CEO sent me a nice note back thanking me, you know, and then I started this thing called the Rookie Club where I invited a senior um, exec down and, and we all, a bunch of us rookies from my class, took them out for beers and, you know, got them a little bit drunk and just asked some questions about how things really worked and did that a few times. My boss went nuts again because I didn't clear it through him. Eventually they made it kind of uncomfortable and made it so I didn't want to be there, but you know, what did I have to lose? And I learned so much. And so, you know, I always tried to just position myself. Um, how can I give myself a, a, a unique advantage and use everything that I'd learned and, and really push ahead because most people, when they get into that first job, they're just terrified trying to fit in. And I really was like, look, if this one doesn't work out, I'll, I'll land on my feet. I'll go to the next one. And, and that was kind of my attitude. Well, you really don't know yourself, right? I mean, you've gone to school this whole time. And this is, you know, maybe if you're an MBA student, you had some time in a career and, you know, maybe you were on a track where you were trying to get to a partnership or you were trying to, you know, get to a certain level in management. Um, but you're still young. Right. And, and so you're in your 20s, you're, you know, early to mid 20s. And so you really don't know yourself yet. And and I, I was kind of honest with myself saying, look, this, this is my 20s. You know, this is where I'm supposed to mess up. This is where I'm supposed to take chances. This is before I have a family. This is before I have a lot of debt. This is before I had a mortgage, you know. So financially, if it didn't work out, 
you know, my downside wasn't great because I hadn't spent all kinds of money and, and created these obligations where paying my bills became my first priority. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then let me ask you this related to that. Um, a lot of them, like myself included, you know, have, have an itch along the way. I should be doing something bigger, better, greater for the greater good or myself. When is that right? I know, I know you just talked about take those risks in your 20s, but you know, there's obviously life and everything that happens. But what is your views on kind of like finding that purpose in life or you know, going for that thing that's bigger and better than yourself and, and when to well, do you're not gonna, You're not going to know it right off the bat, right? That's just part of growing up, you know? And you know, everybody's different. You just have to, you know, find that point yourself. But it's really a matter of preparation. You know, there's an old thing that Bobby Knight, an old coach at Indiana University said, one time I was at, when I was in college, um, he was on 60 Minutes. And he comes on and I'm paraphrasing him. He said, look, everybody's got the will to win. But it's only those with the will to prepare that do win. And that's effectively how you're going to define who you are and those risks that you're able to take. And that process of finding yourself and and finding what it is that you think you need to be. You know, we all have that feeling inside. Some of us might be starting a business. Other of us might be, you know, some social um, obligation that you feel the, the need to have an impact. Whatever it is, we all have something that we feel inside that we're destined to do. But then what do you do next? You know, do you go, do you prepare? Do you, do you work at it? Do you, you know, again, put yourself in a position to succeed? Do you do something that gives yourself the ability to accomplish that or is it just a feeling and you don't take any action? So, you know, people talk about their passions all the time. But what I tend to do is look to see where I put my time and where other people put their time. Because as passionate as you might be about something, you know, unless you're really putting your time there, you're, you're telling yourself something, right? And it's hard, to, it's hard to find a career in something you're not good at. Right. It's kind of finding that passion with what you can really be better than other people at and then where you can kind of out hustle, I feel like everyone else to kind of do that, right? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, no one quits anything they're good at. <laughs> you know, when you're good at something, you, you really feel good about it. And, you know, where people really have stellar careers or, or create stellar businesses or create, you know, stellar um, impacts on, on the world is when they find what, they're, what they love to do and they become great at it. You know, so if, if you're able to put in the time to become great at something, that's when great things happen. If you just feel like this is my passion and then you, you know, go play video games or have a drink, you know, you're lying to yourself. And that's one of the biggest challenges people have. You know, we, we, no one wants to think, you know what, I'm average. <laughs> Nobody wants to think that. And, and so we lie to ourselves and say, I'm, I'm special or this is my passion or I'm destined or this is, you know, what I think I'm really good at. And then we don't do anything about it. And so if you're really going to be great at something, you have to put in the effort to be great. And, you know, when you look at the greats in, in athletics, as an example, you know, Dirk Nowitzki, Luka Doncic now, you know, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, the stories of the effort that they put in is, are just legendary. You know, lots of people go into sports because they're talented. Lots of people go into business because they got straight A's. And they, they took a major that really, you know, gave them an edge. And then they stopped. You know, they stopped trying to be great. And that's the key. You know, find something you love to do and be one of the best. If you can't walk into a room for whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, whether social impact, business, your own company or someone else's, and say, I know more about this subject than anybody in the room, then you're not working hard enough. Uh, that's perfect. I, one thing I want to hit on just on like goals. Um, I had on Anthony Scaramucci on the last one and he talked about how the mooch. He, yes, I know. And then I went back to his Instagram. I saw you guys on like the salt stuff yeah. and, I was more, and look, you know, uh, you guys have a few more followers than me now, but, um, but <laughs> he kind of talked about how like he went um, after Harvard law school, he like wrote down his goals and there were very few things happened that way. Life's not linear. I wanted to ask you as another great businessman, like, what do you think about goals? Like, do you set goals? You know, how do you, how do you think about yeah. goals? Do you think it's overrated? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely set goals. Like, you know, when I graduated, I had a list of industries I wanted to get a job in. I just needed a job. The last time the unemployment rate was in double digits was the year I graduated from college. And so it was, it was not a simple thing, right? And so just getting a job was an accomplishment. Um, getting a job in the tech industry was a bigger accomplishment. Um, but in terms of my goals, I wanted to retire by the time I was 35. 
because to me, the greatest asset that, and this is from my dad, the greatest asset you can own is time or that you can't own is time. You can't get it back, you know? And so I wanted to be in a position where I could just do whatever I wanted and have enough to do it. I read this book, How to Retire by the Age of 35, which effectively said, if you can live, if you can save up enough money to live like a student, you know, then you're going to have fun and, and you're going to be able to get by. And, and that's what, that was my goal. And so, you know, I went, when, after I got fired from your business software and started micro solutions, I went seven years without a vacation. And I'm not saying I never had fun, right? I went out with my friends and all that stuff. And, you know, but at the same time, um, when they were going to trips to Mexico and Vegas or whatever, I would, I had my company and it took me seven plus years, but you know, we built it up to 30 million plus sales back in the eighties and, and I sold it and I retired Bought a lifetime pass in American airlines. And I retired, realized that, you know, I could invest in stocks and, and started trading technology stocks and crushed it, you know? And so, you know, I, so I'm not opposed to setting goals. The question becomes, what are you going to do behind them? Got it. Then working, working towards them. That, that's helpful. On the, um, on the point around like the last crisis, obviously a lot of our, our young professionals are, are staring right in the eye with, 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 with the crisis right now. Um, in your opinion, I mean, I want to ask a couple questions on this, but first, like what, what is your outlook for what is going to look different after crisis? I think we're, we're seeing crises on multiple fronts, but maybe what, what you think will look different and, and what you'd like to see look different? Maybe. I don't know exactly. And that's the opportunity, right? Everybody who's watching, you know, this is your chance to define how you want the world to look, you know, how you want this country to look. You know, you've got big business and medium-sized businesses concerned with their legacy businesses and trying to get those back to par and trying to figure out what they're going to do next. You've got small businesses trying to get back to par because it's very difficult for them to invest, to keep up. And then you've got technology businesses that are crushing it because we're seeing an acceleration trend line to, to digital um, that's benefited. But across all the everything else you know how do you want the world to look you know when we look back in 20 years we'll, we'll look at the epidemic of 2020 and, and the protests of 2020 so what a great time it would have been to start a business because everything was going through a reset and so if you have a vision for how you want the world to look if you have a vision for you know a new type of, of, of company or whatever it may be there is no better time in the history of times to start it up and now yeah. because you can set your own ground while everybody else is scrambling just to stay alive well actually that is a refreshing perspective because we're always spending the time in like this whole doomsday but i think looking at it as an opportunity is just like uh, I, there's I, so I, many opportunities right now i mean you look at ambient voice we're trying to get into a touch-free world right and one of the like if i was starting right now so if, if i couldn't get a job straight out of undergrad right I become I do what I did at your business software back then I taught myself how to program it basic and database languages and the like and scripting languages um, now I, I become an expert in Cortana Microsoft Cortana but more so in Google Home and Amazon Alexa like I've, I've learned about Amazon's um, Alexa scripting it's really easy because I'd like to mess with my kids and I set up these little scripts so that when they give um, Alexa different commands at the house that you know, or I can, I can ask the command while their friends are over and mess with them. And, and so, but it, I did it to learn it because I would, if I was starting, if I just didn't have a job and, and just got stuck, I, I would be out there going to businesses, neighbors, you name it and saying, okay, I'm going to teach you how to use touch free, make this touch free, use ambient voice to really change your businesses because it, we're learning, we're becoming more and more comfortable. Those of us who use Alexa, Alexa all the time. We'll walk into hotel rooms and, you know, just out of habit say, Alexa, what's the weather? Or Alexa, what's this, right? And so you're seeing the impact. So that's one. And then AI, you have to know AI because there's so much BS out there. Look, I didn't, I didn't go to the school for AI, obviously, but I'm taking classes in AI, reading books on AI, watching um, YouTube videos, learning how to do neural networks on my own. You know, here's a three-layer neural network in JavaScript using PyTorch, whatever it may be, what's the difference between a generative versus a reinforcement versus machine learning, you know, because you have to know those things because we're really falling into a world of companies that are AI haves and AI have nots. And if you don't fully understand that, it's, it's like not understanding accounting or finance, you're gonna be at the mercy of somebody else. And in this world, AI is gonna be driving everything. And behind that's robotics. 
Well, that was going to be my next question. You really led right in that. So those are, in your opinion, those are the skills as, as we think ahead the next three to five years that people should really be building in order to kind of succeed in, in the careers of the future. Because I, I always kind of, in my mind, think about the hard skills, technical skills versus like people skills and, and kind of how do, you, how do you balance those and build the, you know, the, the technical as well as the EQ uh, that it requires to succeed. So maybe, maybe what, what are your well, thoughts? Well, the EQ always has to be there, right? And some of us, for some of us, it took a long time. It took me a long, long time to recognize that that being nice was a lot better and got me more results than yelling um, or, you know, rolling my eyes at people. <laughs> I was an eye roller more than a yeller. Um, but yeah, and not three to five years, three to five months. Literally, if you don't understand AI right now, you, you're going to lose. Period, end of story. You will be a dinosaur the day you graduate. And I don't care if you're in sports management. I don't care. I mean, everything that we're trying to do at the Mavericks is driven at some level by AI because we know we need to be good at it. I don't care if you're in finance, you know, and if you're a programmer, if you thought you're straight because you learned how to program and, you know, let's just say R and Python and C++, you know, if you go old school a little bit, um, realize if you're just a basic level programmer, as processing speeds get faster and faster, you're going to get replaced because that's the whole design of AI is to be able to, to take on mathematical processes, right? And there's nothing more math driven than programming. That's, that's the underpinning of all programming. And so, you know, it, it almost is better to be a liberal arts major plus an expert in AI than it is to be a programmer unless you get directly into AI. So you have to be very cognizant that so much of AI is going to impact, AI is going to impact pretty much everything that we touch in business. And you have to have some, you have to have more than just a basic understanding of it. That makes sense. Uh, I like your liberal arts approach well, because I think you think about analyzing problems critically and, and maybe developing that mindset. I love that. Um, yeah, and it's not just analyzing problems critically. You have to have domain knowledge too, right? So when you dig into AI, the harder, one of the hardest parts of AI is knowing if it's right or not, right? It can spit out a lot of things, but you don't know if it's actually correct. And so you need domain knowledge to check for, for um, authority and also for biases, you know? And so there's so many elements and those are going to be critically important and we're running into companies like, you know, the FANG stocks that are all AI whiz kids, and then even multi-billion dollar companies who are awful at AI, who are going to start falling further and further behind. And if you don't understand a company's AI capabilities, you may end up going to work, going to work for the next horse and buggy carriage company. Right. That's, that's so interesting. I think that applies in every industry to your point. Like finance, yeah. so many guys, so many people that are kind of doing that in, in other industries as well. Let me, let me just ask you on education then, you know, obviously we see a lot of schools, a lot of our schools have gone remote, right. And, and who knows what's going to happen. What do you think, like, you know, it's, it's really a lot of opportunities spun up and, and some of the things that we're working on have really been, been popular. Um, what would you, what would you like to see in the future of education or, or you know, where, where, what do you think we're headed there? Again, another opportunity. You know, online is good, but you, the social mechanism is critically important as well. You know, what's going to happen depends on what happens with COVID because you have older teachers who have, are going to be at risk if, if without remote learning. And, and so there's just so many ways to reformat. And I think the bigger issue in education, um, particularly collegiate education, is just the economics of universities and colleges. You know, be, you know you've got immigration issues. And so the, the, the number one um, revenue source in a lot of universities are immigrant students who come in and pay full price, particularly from China. You've got really top heavy um, academic, um, top heavy um, administrative costs in a lot of universities. You know, one time somebody asked me why I didn't build buildings at Indiana University, you know, to put my name on them. And it's because they increase tuition. You know, I try to shame anybody that I know that's rich who gives money to build a name and a building in their name because those buildings keep on eating forever and they end up raising tuition. And so until you deal with the fundamental problems of the economics of universities, it's going to be really difficult to try to come up with the right solution in terms of actually educating, because it goes back to what I said earlier, they try to protect, you know, existing larger businesses try to protect their existing legacy businesses because that's how they're structured. And so they're going to try to make everything new fit into what everything old was and that's a problem. So I think there could be a lot of new paradigms um, for education. I think we can start to see what happens. And actually, my attorney, Robert Hart, brought this up. In Germany, they do a lot of apprenticeships. But the way, you know, we think of apprenticeships here in terms of, of skilled hand, you know, physical jobs, right? You know, you're a blacksmith or whatever, right? You're a welder. 
but there's no reason why you couldn't take a college, a high school graduate or a college graduate even and put them through very um, distinct training uh, mechanisms that educate them with the skill sets that fit that, that organization, as opposed to just sending them to college and hoping that it turns out to be the right way. Use your local community college for you know, the introductory humanities, your introduction to sociology and psychology and freshman writing or whatever classes you have to take, your accounting classes, your finance classes, because those are all basic introductory classes. And then once you start um, stepping up into specific um, knowledge-based things that apply to the industry that company's in, you know, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there to really disrupt education and integrate it into organizations because I, I think the change um, in technology is just going to accelerate because the, the problem piece is the colleges themselves. The, the part that needs disrupted because their economics are so upside down are the actual universities, yet that's exactly what we do. It doesn't matter if it's Maryland or Indiana or Harvard or Howard or University of Pittsburgh, whatever it is, those, that's the business that's messed up, right? That's the part that's broken. And so until we do something to disrupt them out of business or fix them, right, we're always going to have these challenges that we have to discuss, which is good for you, right? Because it gives you a chance to, to fix all these pieces. But, um, and, and it's a great spot for Elevate to be in. But at the same time, you know, when you're trying to change the um, supply chain, and in this case, the supply chain of IP, you've got to look for your weak links. And the weak links right now are the educational system from you know, high schools, you know, middle schools, high schools, and colleges and universities, they're a mess. And that's going to hold us back. But that's also a unique opportunity, particularly now going through all these remote learning changes. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, maybe we'll kind of shift a little bit. The next topic I wanted to hear uh, your thoughts as an investor. A lot of our students want to go become, you know, investors for their careers, either yeah. in equity or, or, you know, on the, on the public side or, or maybe on the venture side. So, I guess I want to start like more micro on your shark tank, like your persona there. Right. Maybe. What is like when, when someone comes in, like what is your intuition on a founder and company? Sure. Really like what are the things going through your mind, right? When you hear someone. So the first it? thing I look for is, is it a deal that makes me say, why didn't I think of that? Right. Because as an entrepreneur, I'm like, okay, I want to be able to, I want to be the one thinking of the great ideas. And so every now and then someone comes in, it doesn't happen a lot. The second thing is, um, what can I do to help this business? right? Is this something that fits my wheelhouse? Can I make them better? And then the third is, is this truly an entrepreneur? Is this someone trying to get on television? Or, you know, is this somebody who's actually going to put in the work? Because we have, you know, the downside that's not traditional is, you know, it's the world's greatest commercial. So you get a lot of people coming on there just trying because they want to be on Shark Tank as opposed to because they're great entrepreneurs. Once I can discern which of the above or which combination of the above, then I make the decision you know, can I make money on this or is it just for a good cause, right? Because in traditional investing, I'm not there for the good cause, right? I don't do charity, but for Shark Tank, sometimes because there's going to be millions and millions of people watching this for the next decades, right? You know, sometimes you want to send a message that, you know, you've got to do the right thing. And so those, that's kind of the thought process I go through. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And then as you think about as, as an investor, as you built your investing career in more broadly, like, you know, when you think about identifying your edge, do you think that, or, or the investing process itself, do you think it's something you develop over your career? Are you more like naturally, you know, born with it? Or is it with experience? Kind of maybe, maybe break it down for us a little bit. So um, Steve Jobs said everything's a remix, right? And that's kind of what I truly believe that I, I tried to create um, very specific skills and, and then there's one natural component. So my, my greatest skills are being able to apply technology to almost any business. So I understand technology and you can walk me into any business anywhere, right? I don't care what it is and I'll understand how they make money in two minutes flat, right? And I'll, I'll be able to look at it and determine where the weak points are in two minutes flat. And so my natural skill is to be able to do it so quickly, right? And so like when people, guest sharks come on Shark Tank, you know, the comments I always get from them are, damn, how'd you figure that out so fast, right? Or how did you get to the bottom of that so fast? And, and so that's what I do. So I can get right to the point of the heart of the matter very quickly. And then because I have the technological skills and I work hard to keep, keep those up, like I mentioned with AI and robotics, et cetera, you know, then I can apply it and say, okay, 
if you're going to compete, and since I understand your business, and once I do my homework and your competitors, I'm going to know what you can do. And so those are, that's really my skill set. And so, you know, and then with that, I can say, okay, here's how we can grow you, right? Here's the things that we can do. But it all comes down to effort on my part. If I wasn't spending three, four hours a day reading up, you know, taking um, courses, like I said, to learn the new technologies, but also so to try to keep up as much as possible within different industries, then I wouldn't be able to, to have the impact that I do. And so when I do vet, investing, I, I'm, I'm really not a VC, right? Because um, it's not just, you know, venture, let's hit one out of 10. It's I want to hit 100 out of 100. You know, I don't, but, you know, I, I don't do badly. Um, and then to me, I'm not, I'm not big on financial engineering. You know, I, I think that it's not that it's bad. But it's, I, I'm just not a fan. You know, I, I just think it doesn't really have a soul. And that, that's horrible. I, as a capitalist and as an entrepreneur, I hate to even say those words. But financial engineering, I don't think really adds value. You know, it puts money in your pocket. It's a great way to make money. And if that's your ultimate goal is just to make money and everything else be damned, go for it. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, look, we could, we get a whole discussion on this, but I, I agree with you. I sure. think you know, investors that are actually the most fulfilled and I think success when you measure it, when you're 50, 60, et cetera, I think are the ones that feel like they've helped people build things. But getting a return, a cash on cash return is never a bad thing, right? There's a value to it and getting out the inefficiencies. And once you've run a business long enough, you realize that you build up these inefficiencies because you can't just reevaluate every minute of every day. And, and so you know, you want to be, you wish you could go through and clean things up, but there's also the human factor because you know these people, right? And there's times, you know, and so, and that's been good and that's been bad for me at, at various points. But when you come in and it's just, okay, we need to make a 10% or 12 or 15% return on, for our investors or 20%, even when those things get all the way to their desired outcomes, you're, you typically don't have great companies. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think it's more of like the means to end for, as well as kind of what are you defining? If you use only financial metrics to define it, then you may not be at a kind of a, a kind of a... Yeah, look, and, and again, it just depends on who you are and what you want to accomplish. Look, I'm not, it's easy for me to say now that I'm rich, right? But when I was poor, right, I still felt the same way, you know, that it wasn't just about, okay, I got to squeeze every nickel out. I got to squeeze every dime out. That was never me at all. You know, and that's one of the reasons I always gave my employees equity. You know, and every time I ever sold a company, they always got paid and did really well. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Um, a couple, a, a kind of one question I want to ask: like when you're looking to hire someone for Cuban Enterprises or your, you know, or your your VC, VC firms, etc., what are some other than competency and maybe ability? What are some intangible skills you'd like to see, or you can even pitch our people, the three thousand people that are listening? You know, come work for Mark Cuban. What do you want to see? Well, I want to be brutally honest. I suck at hiring, right? I suck, right? And that's a compliment to me because. I'm not even that good. And so I learned early on not to be the one doing the hiring because I'm a salesperson and what I learned about myself and part of all this, you have to be brutally self-aware. If you know, we, we have a tendency to lie to ourselves about ourselves, but um, I learned the hard way early on. I learned what I'm not good at and I made sure that I had a really good HR person um, once the company got big enough or I had somebody in the organization that was really good at hiring. And there's an old saying, Hire slow and fire fast. And it took me a while to really come to grips with that, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, on, on, you, on your lessons learned as a CEO in the NBA, but also as a CEO of your companies, maybe, I just want to hit on the NBA for a second. Obviously, avid basketball fan, you know, I remember in, I think, 2011, right, when you guys won the title, it was yep. like, happy and you beat the, yep. you know. Nine years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, well, what, um, what are the lessons you've learned from running your NBA team? I mean, obviously, like, sure. you took a franchise, frankly, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not that old, but I remember... The, the Mavs kind of had their ups and downs before you came, right? Yeah, so we were awful. We got voted the worst professional sports franchise of the 90s. And I learned some hard lessons, actually. And I'll tell you the, the, the hard lessons. Um, so the basketball side has its ups and downs, right? And that's really what I put my focus. And I had a CEO that I kind of just let do their own thing. And a couple of years ago, the Mavs went through a sexual harassment problem where we had a CEO that, you know, I'd given pretty much autonomy and he was harassing people and I had no idea. We had two other employees also that fell into it. And I always thought, you know what, if you just treat everybody equally and you were colorblind, then you were going to be okay. And I learned that that's not the way to be. And this is really something that 
everybody needs to know for the companies they may run, the companies they may start, the companies they may work for. Colorblind is, you know, I always thought it was more like a math equation. If, if I treated you, a woman, you know, exactly the same, that was equality. But it really didn't respect all the differences and the challenges that different people go through, right? And so I learned the hard way, you know, we had to fire a lot of people. Um, I brought in the first African-American woman CEO to the NBA, Sint Marshall, who taught me a lot. And one of the things I learned from her and others is treating people equally doesn't mean treating them the same. And so you've got to really recognize that you can't be colorblind, that you have to look at people's differences, nuanced or otherwise, but that also creates the opportunity. So like I would have people who look like me trying to sell to the Indian community. Dallas is the sixth largest Indian community in, in the country. And so, and there's a lot of great basketball fans and Mavs fans there, but I didn't, you know, the guys I had selling into that community didn't really understand the community, right? There's differences, right? And so, you know, there, there's little nuanced things like there's little restaurants and there's a certain term when you have older women running these restaurants and there's different, you know, nomenclature for this and dealing with that and connecting with them, right? And so I learned that we were better off when we hired, you know, Hispanic people to, to sell and, and women to sell, sell to Hispanic women, you know, men to sell men. And it's not that one isn't capable of selling to the other, but you miss a lot of the nuances. And, you know, I've learned from that, that you know, with a lot of my companies, you know, where, where is that representation on their boards? Where is that representation, you know, in management? But even more importantly, where is that representation in feet on the street? Because there's so many doors that don't get open when you don't have somebody from that community. And it, I, I left so much money on the table by not having somebody who can sell into the Indian community, by selling into the Hispanic community, by selling into all the different you know, communities that are in any city, large or small. And, and so I think one of the things that lessons I'd want to convey is you know, diversity isn't a checklist. Diversity isn't about just saying, okay, I've got this covered. It's about understanding that it's a better way to make money that you're leaving, you can make so much more money when you actively and organically and authentically sell into those communities that you can't turn a blind eye to it. Because if I, now if I'm competing with you, I'm gonna go in there and take all that market share away from you because I'm gonna have somebody who's that authentic in that community and knows how to sell and knows how to support and knows how to modify, you know, enhance my product to fit that community. And so that's huge and that's, it was the hardest lesson I learned. It was, mo it was incredibly painful for the people in the organization that suffered through it, but I learned a lot. And really, you know, it's made all my other companies stronger as a result. It made me smarter. That's really powerful. I was going to ask you about kind of next, but let me, let me move that up here. Um, like the stuff we're seeing right now, right, in terms of just the, the greater need for, you know, um, uh, just, just equality and then just awareness of different issues. What do you think like corporations or individuals can and should be doing? And you alluded to some of this, right? And understanding that diversity doesn't mean the same for everyone. Maybe, maybe your thoughts on what's going on right now and how we can all be better citizens and, and, and companies. This is a white people problem, you know, and I hate to say it. You know, in your community, it's not, your, it's not the people that look like you that are causing problems for you, right? When you walk in the door, it's not the people that look like you that are staring at you. You know, when you, when you do something and you're walking through the neighborhood and you feel somebody looking at you, it's not the people that look like you that are looking, it's people like me that are doing the looking, right? And so, you know, in the past, I never would have said that. In the past, I never, you know, like I said, I was colorblind and I thought, you know, that, that meant that it couldn't be me. Right. And so what's happened is white people in particular try to manufacture equivalency. You know, we say, well, you know, I was in school with, you know, some of my best friends were this color or that color or this race or this ethnicity or that. So it can't be me. But that really ignores the, the bigger issue. Now, you know, it's been called white privilege. Nobody likes that word because when you're white, because it makes you feel defensive, you immediately, are, you know, it can't be me. No one wants to think they're privileged. But the reality is, I, you know, I used to have long hair when I was in high school and I, I never drove a car that cost more than $200. So I got pulled over all the time, right? But I never was in fear right. <laughs> that something was going to happen. That's white privilege. Maybe that's not the best term, but even today, it's the same thing. I, you know, I have a 10 year old son and I'm not having to have the conversation of how to deal with the police if you get pulled over, you know, or even if you were 16, obviously age matters, but 
you know, those are things that white people need to have discussions about. And if you're sitting next to somebody and you hear them make somebody, even if it's an inert racist type comment, right? You know, just something that's not um, obvious. You still have to say something. You still have to do something because that's the only way things change. So it's on us. Yeah. And it's going to be really difficult and really painful and really hard. But this is now's the time. And, you know, to the people who are out there because you're relatively young, what would be better than in 30 years, 50 years, 60 years, when you're talking to your kids and your grandkids, you would be able to say, I was there and I helped change society. I mean, what could be better than that? That is so powerful. And I think that's a lasting legacy we all can have. It does it kind of the next yes. I, I love that. Um, and one, one thing on the NBA before we jump to the rapid fire part, sure. like, um, what, so obviously what is your outlook on kind of coming back to basketball? I mean, and look, sports are such an integral part of like the, you know, our society, right? So when, when we're removed from it for so long, you know, maybe, maybe your outlook on coming out of it, where is the opportunity and, and, and how does this like kind of recovery look like for all sports, maybe not just the NBA? So just talking pure sports. I mean, we all need something to cheer for. We all need something to get excited about. We all need a diversion right now. And so hopefully the NBA can do that, you know, and, you know, for those of you who like the Eagles, the old Hotel California song, yes. you can check in, but you can never leave. That's going to be our quarantine, right? You know, you can check in, but you can never leave until you're eliminated from the, the season or the playoffs. And, you know, we'll go from there. there. There'll only be minimal fans, which are execs and owners and, you know, and, and then maybe towards the end when we get to the conference finals and finals, they'll allow family. But I think once we get playing, it'll be good for the entire country because it would get, just give everybody a chance to, to get excited. And I also think, you know, the, the NBA is enough of a socially adept um, um, organization that we'll make sure that we'll keep the important things that matter up front and, and center in, in everybody's mind. And that'll be a, a, there'll be a constant um, stream of support information coming from the players. Yeah, I'm excited. I feel like it reminds me almost of when I was, I was younger now, but what kind of baseball did for post 9-11, but this is kind of at a, such a grander global stage than I think yeah. that was New York centric. And I remember when the Yankees, play, I, I think they played the Mets or something, but I think it was such yep. a unifying event that I, I'm, I'm exactly super- Exactly right. Right? So yeah, I, we, we just want something to cheer for and get excited about, you know, and something yeah, to bring us together. Have, everyone in the audience can cheer on the maps this year and, and going forward. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, a couple, I, I wanted to kind of, um, a few rapid fire questions I had you for Mark. Again, describe your first feelings when you became a billionaire. I think, you know, what, what was going I through? Was, I was sitting in front of the computer, hit F5, hit the refresh key, right, on Yahoo Finance. And I was sitting there naked. I'd just gotten up and out of the shower. And I hit, because I knew, you know, the market was open and it was going to be close. And I did my little billionaire dance. And then I went back to work because the one thing I didn't want to do was lose it. <laughs> right, right, right. We, we, you know, the first guy up and then and then back down. That's funny. Um, I, I think I think I would I would be naked and, and running around doing a dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, and then so so the next thing I think this has been it's been on my mind actually as I see you on all these um all these places like would you run for president, Mark? Uh, you know, if my family would have said yes, I would have. Okay. You know, but they voted it down. You're not closing the door. No, I'm not closing the door. Um, it's the only office I would run for, but yeah, it's not my all-time dream, but given all the circumstances, it's something I, I seriously consider. What would be the first like two or three things you work on right now? Healthcare, yeah. healthcare first and foremost. You have you know, um, 40 million, give or take, people who have lost their jobs, which means they probably also lost their health insurance, yet nobody's even talking about healthcare. And then before that, healthcare, the pricing was out of whack. And, you know, I actually have invested in all these different studies and I can tell you why it's out of whack. It's healthcare costs and the lies and this and that. But at the same time, you know, number one would be healthcare. Um, number two would be a federal um, transitional, not permanent, transitional jobs program. Because when you have 40 million people out of work, everybody's afraid they can lose their job, which means they don't spend money. We're a consumer driven economy. And so if people are fearful and they're only saving, which is what's happening right now, the savings rate went up to 33.3%. And one, step, one thing I saw from the Fed. And so you need to create jobs, whether, um, you know, whether it's tracking and tracing, you know, long-term care, um, taking care of people who are vulnerable during a, a, a virus environment like this, you know, during a pandemic. And so training people and creating those jobs, which can have long-term staying pro um, possibilities, but also will be productive. Um, so those would be the top two things. Yeah, and then hopefully like integrating technology into everything that we do from a from a. Well, yeah, and that's part of the problem, right? Because you know you 
don't have anybody who's technologically literate that's running for office anywhere for that matter, right? And so when we talk about government, you know, the nat my natural inclination is to say too much government is always bad. But once you start understanding AI, as long as you build in the governors for bias and some of the other issues, then you start talking about government as a service. And so you can expand the impact of government by and still reduce the costs and yeah. the bureaucracy of it. Yeah, I also, I also feel like it used to be like a lot of the smartest people got hired by the government. I feel like a lot, now a lot of these people are going to all these companies and, and again, maybe their talent issue as well from, from, the, from the ground up. A um, couple other questions. Who've been your mentors, Mark, uh, that, that you look up to over your career? Mostly my dad. You know, and my dad never graduated from college, but he really tried to, to support me and help me and, and motivate me and teach me how to deal with people. I was never beyond that for business. I was never really um, a big mentor guy because I never really had access. I didn't really have a network, you know? And so, um, you know, I went to Indiana and even going through the business school, I was more running around just with my friends than trying to build a network. And, and so I never really had a network. And then, you know, it was all just on me. And, and obviously it turned out okay, but it really, that gave me my motivation to have to figure out everything for myself. And that's really helped me over the years. Sure, but that is a huge burden, like your point, just kind of, so, I mean, it's kind of related to one thing. We're, we're trying to build this huge network here of people, which sure. crosses these schools and stuff. So I think that, that really relates to it. No, it's good. Look, it never hurts to know people. Right. right. But the key is, do you use a mentor as a crutch or do you use it as an accelerator? If you're using it as an accelerator, but you're still going to learn and you're get, using it for introductions, that's great. Right. right. Let me meet, you know, all these different people and maybe they'll open the door for me. But I get so many people who say, will you be my mentor? You know, and then they ask questions and it's like, no, you've got to do the work, right? The minute you ever find yourself trying to do it as a shortcut, you're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. That gets in the mindset thing as well. Um, a couple more, I think. So any failures, like maybe something that you really learned from either early on or career that you, that, that sticks with you and, and kind of how do you deal with failure? Oh my God. Um, look, it doesn't matter how many times you fail. You only got to be right once, right? And, and that's always been my, mot my motto because um, I failed more times than I could have been fired from jobs, quit jobs, you know, businesses that didn't work, investments that didn't work. Um, and I just learned, you know, sales cure. I guess the best lesson I learned is the early jobs I had that like what I got fired from that made me start my company. The company wasn't focused on sales. Right. And so the guy, the CEO did everything but sell. And so I learned what not to do in, in those cases. And you've got, if you're the CEO of your company or you're a top exec and you can't sell and you're not the company's best salesperson, how do you expect anybody else to sell? If you're not, you know, if you're not the biggest advocate and you can't walk in and close the door, close a deal because you know how to, you know, the application of your product or service, you know, you've got to know how to sell. Got it. Do you have a morning routine? Do you have a routine that works for you? Or are you like, you know, different every day? No, um, get up. Um, check my emails, um, start reading things, you know, news of the day, technology stuff, um, try to find something, a technology topic I want to advance my knowledge on, you know, typically AI, or now it's a little bit more robotics because I think, you know, you talk about things I would do. Um, right now, we're probably behind Korea, Japan, Germany, and China, maybe tied with China and robotics, and we're not the leader, but if we're really gonna try to have an impact in the global, um, economy and we're going to try to beat china or just to say over overseas manufacturing in general we're going to have to get a lot better robotics so i just try to make sure that there's something new that i'm getting up to speed on so that again if i walk into the room i can understand how to kick everybody's ass got it um and then lastly any business leaders maybe world leaders over time that, that you admire i know you I said like elon musk i really do i like elon because he finds you know all, all these things he comes up with are like why didn't i think of that you know, and not only why didn't I think of that, but how the hell is he even going to make it happen? And he does, right. you know, he finds a way and he always puts it all on the line and goes for it. And so I, I truly admire that before him was Ted Turner. So when I was a kid, Ted Turner was buying baseball teams, winning yacht races, you know, drinking champagne out of the bottle. And so when I was broke, <laughs> that, that was kind of, you know, who I aspired to be like. That's awesome. So let us end with this. For a lot of people, you are that mark, right? So you, I feel like you're this new age Buffett slash, you know, this whole, th all these different people in one, what would you like to leave our audience with for people who are just kind of want to be the most successful that they can? We all have those ideas, especially now, right? Of how we think things should be getting to the other side of the pandemic, all the civil unrest. Just ask yourself a simple question. Why not me? 
You know, why can't I be the person that changes the world? Why can't I be the one that goes for it? Why not you? You know, and just ask yourself next, what do I have to do to get there? And why don't I do it? You know, those just those simple things, write them on your wall, write them on the back of your hand, write them on a piece of paper so you have them that remind you. Put them on your screen as your default screen, you know, just to remind you that it can be you. There's going to be world-changing companies that are created, world-changing charities. We can live our lives completely differently. Maybe that comes from you. Maybe it comes from somebody at Elevate because you just had that mindset. Well, on that note, thank you, Mark, for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. For being a part of this. And, and hopefully, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a good morning thing it was for fun. you. It was fun. Yeah, I enjoyed the questions. And good luck to Elevate. Congrats. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Mark. Thanks again.